Welcome to Reality is Undefeated. I'm at Gatewood. Thank you for tuning in. If a six-year-old goes to the ice cream truck with $5 and they buy a $2 ice cream and they leave that truck without getting their $3 change, whose fault is that? The six-year-old who didn't know that they get $3 and change or the adult who made no effort to give them their $3 and change? If you would blame the child, I would really like to understand why. There's a stage of life that not only are we born into, but that we experience over and over throughout our lives. It's called infancy. Most six-year-olds or first graders would be in the infancy of learning math. And that ice cream truck encounter would put them in the infancy of learning how to use money. You could be 30 years old in the infancy of your career, 40 years old in the infancy of parenthood, 50 years old in the infancy of marriage. But let me not get too far up in age because what I really want to focus on is the infancy of adulthood. From 18 till about 21 years old, a person is in the infancy of adulthood. No matter who you are, you will not know as much at 18 as you will when you're 35, but you'll be labeled an adult the entirety of that time. It is incumbent upon those who are older and who have walked the path before them to put into place structural guidelines that protect and allow young adults to grow through that phase with as much ease as possible. And for the most part, we do that as purchasing alcohol, marijuana, firearms, engaging in legal gaming, and working in a number of career fields require you to be 21 years old. But there are still many areas where we as a society allow young adults to be taken advantage of right before our eyes. There are so many directions I could go to make my point, but there is one glaring example that stands out more than the rest. For years, the NCAA, universities, coaches, and others profited billions of dollars off the back of young adults, athletes who did not have proper representation. They labeled them student athletes, which allowed these entities to take advantage of them with little to nothing guaranteed in return. And because they were adults, there was no parental oversight necessary. Although for many of them, I don't think it would have mattered. Fans, myself included, purchased tickets and poured into stadiums and arenas. We bought hot dogs and nachos, sodas and beers, team merch and souvenirs. Fully knowledgeable that the players we came to see were not receiving a single dime from our patronage. When we could not attend in person, we turned on that tube and we watched as they lined up for fourth and one. Hut, 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 the ball is snapped, and for the next few seconds, players on both sides of that line fought tooth and nail to gain or prevent a yard, sometimes injuring themselves in the process. We watched them dive in the seats for loose balls, run full speed to block shots, narrowly missing a stanchion, falling into baseline fans and photographers, limping as they made their way back to the court. And then we watched commercial break. We brought Dillard's bags to taunt Peter Warwick. We brought crab legs to taunt Jameis Winston. We highlighted the smallest incidents all the way down to Johnny Manziel and Todd Gurley signing autographs. They were penalized for signing their own name. We watched as a bigot called Marcus Smart a racial slur after making one of the aforementioned hustle plays. And when he got up and defended himself by pushing a fan, we watched as the ref gave him a tee and listened as the announcer called it disgusting behavior. The disgusting behavior is what was exhibited by the fan who was clearly 60 plus and knew better. We told them that the scholarship they were receiving was sufficient payment for their efforts, and we said it with such conviction that one would almost believe it were true. Do you know that Alabama football, the premier program in this nation, generated $45.97 million for the university for fiscal year 2023? The cost of tuition at Alabama in the 2022-2023 school year, after room and board and other expenses, was $53,364 non-residents. So when you take that number and you multiply it by 85, the number of full ride scholarships that each division one FBS program is allowed to offer, you see that $4,535,940 or roughly 10% of the annual revenue generated by the program was paid out in tuition. Mind you, that 4597 is net revenue. Travel and other expenses are already accounted for. Alabama basketball, also one of the top programs in the nation, generated $7.76 million that same fiscal year. The Division I scholarship athletes allowed on a basketball roster is 13. Let's do the math. 
$693,732, or roughly 9% of basketball revenue, was paid out in scholarships. Again, net revenue. And there are still three walk-on roster spots where those athletes don't even receive that. The same scholarships were offered to Division I athletes and other programs, even though those programs don't even bring in a percentage of what basketball brings in. And basketball brings in a small fraction of what football does. We stood idle for years as mature adults took advantage of the infancy of others' adulthoods. And every one of us knew it was wrong. Disgusting behavior from all of us. The proper thing to do back then would have been to give the NCAA the blood diamond treatment they deserved until players were properly compensated. There is no reason it should have taken this long to reach the decision that was made a few weeks ago with the NCAA agreeing to a $2.8 billion settlement and universities being able to pay athletes directly. A settlement that many believe was only agreed to because it saves the existence of the NCAA. I believe the NCAA should be disbanded or at the very least, every board member should be forced to resign with the settlement. Side note, if one of our black film producers isn't already in production on an Ed O'Bannon biopic, what are we doing? But let's not act like the NCAA was the only entity with predatory behavior when it came to student athletes. There are so many others that helped fuel the success of the NCAA and also took advantage of these young adults, and they are complicit also. That ranges from television networks, to advertisers, to merchandisers, to sports books, to video games. Although I will give EA Sports credit for stepping away and even professional sports leagues. See, I understand why the NFL requires players to be at least three years removed from high school before they enter the draft. Them grown man bodies on that field. You don't want no 18 year old wide receiver going across the middle and getting hit by a prime Ryan Clark. It'd be a nasty sight. The MLB is excused altogether. A lot of their players are drafted directly from high school and put through their farm systems. But why does the NBA require players to be a year removed from high school in order to be draft eligible? I mean, seriously, what difference does being a year removed from high school make on a basketball court? See, we might not have paid attention to this, but all I do is sit back and peep. Earlier this year, the NBA announced it was nixing its G League Ignite team because college players are getting paid now, so they see it as no reason to keep it. And none of those names that we like to watch debate came out and said, no, nah, NBA, just up the money you're willing to give the high school athlete and compete with the colleges the same way you competed with LeVar Ball and the JBA. I mean, it's not a coincidence that the G League Ignite started a year after LeVar introduced the JBA as an alternative to college. It's just mysterious as to why the NBA would compete with them. The NBA could have implemented a high school to G League path a long time ago if they were concerned about players being paid or not being able to pass an exam. Brandon Jennings' situation highlighted the void that was created, what, in 2008? The NBA did nothing to address it then because they were not concerned about that. They became concerned when it became apparent that there was an opportunity for real investors to buy into the JBA and really fill that void that was created in 2006 when the NBA changed the rules requiring players to be a year removed from high school in order to be draft eligible. But still, why would they be concerned about a void they created? A void that was highlighted shortly after they created it. The JBA wasn't there to compete with the NBA. The NBA was still the goal for 100% of its players. Why did the NBA feel the need to compete with the JBA? To me, it's obvious. The NBA wanted to funnel the top high school basketball players through the NCAA, and forcing them to be a year removed from high school accomplished that goal. Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant's success, both All-Stars, their second season, showed that the talent gap between the top high school players and pro players wasn't as wide as many would expect. That led to more of the top high school players making the jump. See, Garnett was the first to do it in 20 years. He was seen as an anomaly, so there was no issue there. The issue arose when not only did a high school player enter the draft every year afterwards until the rule was changed, but the number of high school players entering the draft would dramatically increase. Nine high school players were drafted from 1995 to 1999, a span of five years. Nine high school players were drafted in 2005 alone. The idea of going straight to the pros became more prevalent. And as a result, the NCAA began losing its appeal and millions of dollars along with it. I've heard some say, well, they needed to see them at a higher level in order to properly evaluate them. Okay, well, let's look at all these high school busts. When you think of the biggest high school to pro bust, it's not Kwame Brown. Kwame Brown played 12 seasons. Out of the 41 players in NBA history to be drafted directly out of high school, only five 
didn't finish the rookie contracts. And out of those who finished the rookie contracts, only one didn't make it to a second contract. Everyone else played at least nine seasons. So that means 85% or the overwhelming majority of players drafted directly out of high school carved out a career that doubled the average career length in the top basketball league. When the smoke clears, there will be five Hall of Famers, three MVPs, six players who made all NBA first team, four other players who made second or third, 10 All-Stars. There are nine players who started on a championship team, four other players who won a chip. And this is in an 11 season span. From when Garnett was taken fifth in 95 to when Amir Johnson was taken 56 in 2005. So it couldn't be the need to evaluate players on a bigger stage. And again, they could have allowed these players to enter the G League straight out of high school and then drafted them straight from there if they wanted to see how they fared against tougher competition. No, they created a special G League team to be appealing to those who found the JBA appealing so they could close the potential floodgates that will be opened by an option other than college becoming available to these players. And with only a number of roster spots available on G League Ignite, that would all but ensure that most of the top talent would end up in college basketball, as going overseas has not shown to be a popular option. These players being highlighted in a March Madness tournament brought the NCAA billions of dollars in revenue and allowed them to fetch nearly billion dollar television rights deals, and we all just sat back and enjoyed the show. And why is this an issue for someone who runs a black improvement channel? Well, it's not a coincidence that these unnecessary hoops, no pun intended, are placed as a barrier to entry for the league with the highest percentage of black players at 70%. Is it? Do y'all remember when I told y'all how systemic racism works? I won't repeat it. I'll just, you know, link the video and the timestamp in the description. In my opinion, the NBA was trying to force the top talent into college ball, and that makes them complicit also. But while I'm concerned, I'm not bothered by it because like I said, basketball doesn't belong to us and this is a chosen path. It's just funny that what they won't do, what they won't require is something that's going to benefit these players long term, long after they've played the game. I've said it for years. I'll say it again and I stand on this. I believe the NBA and other professional sports leagues should require players to have at least a bachelor's degree. But that would benefit our communities outside of sports, so I don't expect to see anything like that anytime soon. And I'll allow my argument for that in another video. But to close out this video, I think we all know who's at fault for why that six-year-old didn't receive change. But what's the more important lesson? For us to check the adult for not giving change? Or for us to let that child experience that and understand that throughout this life, people are going to try and shortchange them? Mm. Subscribe to the channel, man. Wonder if he gonna get somebody they change.